Due to the graphic nature of this program, viewer discretion is advised. Could you imagine living your whole life and never killing? They make their living by murder. I think that people have forgotten what jokes are. Good art disturbs. They're comedians bound by a code of silence. Don't tell anybody. We also send people through the fucking roof. Investigators try to catch these killers hiding in plain sight. That and more, next on American Crime. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. Guilty of murder in the first degree. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Of you and your brother shooting your parents. <sighs> Austin, Texas. Once a quiet college town, it's now a burgeoning city for young professionals and tech millionaires. This boom, however, has brought a new criminal element to this former sleepy burg. Drugs, violence, rampant homelessness. Most insidious of all, savage killers hiding in plain sight. Located on its historic 6th Street in the heart of Austin's Arts District lies the comedy Mothership, home to cold-blooded jesters with malicious intent. Dozens of these murdering clowns take the stage every night, and every night the audiences are callously slain. Comedians with an insatiable bloodlust lay waste to hundreds of people every night. The ringleader is this man, Joseph James Rogan Jr., a former sitcom actor and reality TV host. Joe Rogan is believed to be the head of an underworld organization based around the entertainment and eventual dismemberment of its victims. There's like a thing that happens in scenes where you have this top-down force, mm -hmm. this one guy that's the gold standard. And then you have this army of assassins that's around this guy. Operating with the same playbook, Rogan and his cohorts gain their vast audiences through podcasting, an art form dedicated to the craft of interesting conversations, often falling short of their goal, each show more vapid and mundane than the next. Rogan's show stands head and shoulders above them all. He's the North Star, the guiding light which they all follow. They podcast by day, broadcasting their subliminal messages to millions of people, making them feel as if they're friends, lulling them into a false sense of security, eventually tricking their easily manipulated admirers to see them perform. And then La Jolla Comedy Store, June 2nd through the 4th. That's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. May 26, 27, 28, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It is then, under the cloak of night, deep in the bowels of their clubs, when these savages strike. Mr. Rogan has the number one podcast in the entire world. A veteran of stand-up comedy with over 30 years experience, he regularly sells out arenas due to his popularity. Yet why does this man have extensive martial arts and weapons training? Wouldn't that be unnecessary for someone in his trade? Under close examination, the puzzle pieces start to fall into place. I look like a violent person. I'm just, even the way I'm built, like there's uh, most likely a lot of violence in my ancestry. For years, he's practiced hiding a killer rage with a smile. These days, he no longer finds it easy to subdue his real instincts. I went crazy. <laughs> it brought me back to my fighting days. It was like the same, that person came out again. It was like, well, I didn't even know he was in there. Like, like an assassin, like a killer. Above the law and beyond reproach, these people act with impunity. Law enforcement has turned a blind eye to the deaths of locals and countless tourists. With ties to city and state government, Mr. Rogan is seemingly untouchable. Enticed by the promise of laughter, civilians are regularly brought to their death. But where did this all start? Los Angeles, California. Once the place of Ciro's nightclub, run by mobster Bugsy Siegel, the comedy store became home to a new kind of crime. And then there was one day, you were telling stories and you went on stage just f***ing guns blazing and you murdered harder than I'd ever seen you kill before. I was like, this is crazy, it's like a different person. Rogan is seen here talking to Joey Coco Diaz. Yeah. You're just f***ing hitting them with jokes. They're f***ing laying there like bodies. Diaz is a convicted felon with a violent temper, known for telling tall tales about crimes he never committed, a clever smokescreen used to conceal his real misdeeds. 
Coco Diaz is believed to be an enforcer for the Rogan Syndicate, a hitman tasked with carrying out bloody executions. Our timing's deadly. And at the store, your timing gets real. In the original room? Oh, no. The last guy that mugged me up, it was a little Chinese guy. I'm on the corner watching him, he's watching me. I'm thinking, does he know Kung Fu? <laughs> <laughs> But I was so used to comics and degenerate pool hall people. You and I became friends like that. Meeting in the mid-90s while working at the comedy store, both Rogan and Diaz apprenticed under Mitzi Shore. Nicknamed the godmother of comedy, Mitzi Shore spent decades nurturing the talents of young, impressionable comics, while in secret, molding them into cold-hearted merchants of death who danced on the ends of her puppet strings. She had a whole system. That's why my mom had this natural instinct to develop comedians, because it was in her veins. I mean, we're all disciples. Yeah. We're all disciples of your mom. And when your mom told you you were funny, it was like the greatest gift. Yeah. That's another thing, is she never told me she loved me. I can't say I love you because then you wouldn't be a comic. Oh my God. <laughs> You're a science project. <laughs> in Mitzi's system, if murders are not carried out properly, the comics are ordered to kill the audience with explosives. Comedians call this process bombing and is viewed as an embarrassment. I always say bombing on stage is like sucking a thousand dicks in front of your mother. As a desperate final attempt, when Mitzi's jokers have failed, they'll hurl bombs at their unsuspecting victims with the crowds brought to ghostly silence. Richard Pryor was like, you know, coming back to the comedy store when he was really sick before he died. I was the guy who went on after him oh, every wow. night. Every night for like five weeks. Oh, geez. Every time he did a show. I bombed so many times going on after Richard Pryor. Oh, <laughs> it was death. This was not the only time Joe Rogan bombed an audience. The godmother would purposefully make him go on stage right after a crowd had been destroyed by expert comedians. Not only to demoralize, but also as a patented method to train the killer instincts of her young recruits. I followed Martin Lawrence. Almost every time I worked on a night with Martin Lawrence, Mitzi really? always made me follow Martin Lawrence. And you would just sit there and watch him murder. I mean murder. Falling out of chairs. Mm. I mean screaming in agony. I never bombed harder in my life. Comics face punishment for their failure, often subject to ritualistic sex acts against their will. I watched a lot of guys eat dick. Yeah. Rogan was no exception. And then you would come out. I would eat dick. <laughs> just go up there and just eat plates of shit. It was during this time that he became known covertly as an expert on bombing. Whoa. Like it's blown out. Now, I'm obviously not a fucking bomb expert, but I talked to one. You should see your act. Tired of being under Mitzi's thumb, Joe concocted a scheme. A scheme that would make him the most powerful person at the comedy store. Time Life presents The Sounds of Shab, 60 songs on two CDs, spoken word over ambient music for ultimate relaxation, featuring such classics as... Well, your navy hat would beg the differ. He just said beg the differ. Like haters, right? Incurious? Your parents had you in, when you are how old? Fun. Did you ever find Hitler? Yeah, so he died. Sure, this is my sure, fifth sure, show in sure. two days. It's the beast. I, I know. Yeah. I used to think giraffe was giraffe. I thought it spelled with a D. Yeah, to order the sounds of Sharp, call the number on your screen or send check or money order for the amount shown, plus shipping and handling. Rush delivery available. Call now. After suffering countless humiliations at the hands of Mitzi Shore, a.k.a. the Godmother, Rogan climbed the comedy store ranks. By using a whole range of outrageous Machiavellian maneuvers, he surpassed his rivals in his quest for comedy supremacy. Little did he know what it would cost him. Noodles! By the early 2000s, illness had forced Mitzi Shore into semi-retirement. The once revered comedy store was now a ghost ship being run by handlers and hangers-on. Rogan, seizing on the opportunity, assembled a sinister crew of joke tellers with one intent, controlling the comedy store. They called themselves the Death Squad. Just Are you part of the Death Squad? 
Okay. But they, I have had problems with them because I was in cahoots with Mencia, they thought. However, his takeover was temporarily thwarted after Joe called out a rival killer, Carlos Menstelia, for stolen valor, sparking a nasty turf war. I walk into the comedy store, dude, after legends walk in there. Chris Rock was on stage. So I went on after Chris and I just destroyed the room. That's where I got the nickname The Punisher. Of course I fucking steal jokes. When I come to a comedy club, you better run, bitch. The ensuing power struggle at the comedy store resulted in Joe's banishment. I called Mitzi and gave her the whole rundown. And then she gave me a spot that night. And then they called me up two hours later to tell me that I was banned. So I said, wait a minute, if she's not running the store, who's deciding I'm banned? Down but not out, Rogan began plotting his way back to the top, biding his time, waiting for the perfect opportunity to present itself. It came in the form of podcasts. Always an early adopter, Joe rose fast in a sparse landscape with limited competition. Only after achieving vast popularity as a podcaster, did Rogan return to the comedy store to reign without opposition. The new guys and girls that were coming up, they were fucking good, man. I was like, wow, I'd been gone for almost a decade. Quickly surpassing the influence of Mitzi Shore, Joe was nicknamed The Godfather. And at the comedy store, The Godfather was king. You know, Rogan, to me, is the leader of the pack. Five, six years ago, seven years ago at the comedy store, it was the comedy rap pack. And we were the we were the Rat Pack, and we were the guys. And every show was sold out. Our names on the marquee. And Rogan, there was a you know their structure. Speaking here is Brenton Schwab, a failed protege of the Toe Father, whose career was crushed under the weight of his overinflated ego. Schwab, now lost without Joe as his surrogate father figure, recounts the highs and lows of being in the Rogan inner circle. I used to pull up. And Rogan pull up in his Porsche and we'd park next to each other and talk shop about the cars and what's next. And then Santino would pull up and we'd talk to him and Chris D'Elia and then Brian would pull up and Bobby Lee and Theo and we'd be in there and it was the best. It was, it was the absolute best. Everything seemed to be right in the Rogan kingdom, but tensions were growing. In late 2020, Joe was forced to flee California for Texas after Governor Gavin Newsom assembled a task force focused on the apprehension of Rogan and his goons. Newsom is terrified that his son is listening to Joe Rogan. I really worry about these micro cults that my kids are in. And then immediately he's talking about Joe Rogan. And I'm like, here it is, the pathway. We're also investing hundreds of millions in new programs to tackle the root causes of crime. That is the California way. I was like, this ain't going in a good direction, and yeah. I fucking smell chaos. Word was out about the slaughters taking place under Rogan's command. What I saw in California was an erosion of freedom, and I saw it getting worse and worse, and I got the fuck out of there. And that's why I came to Texas. And the leader of the Rat Pack leaves, Joe Rogan leaves, and the comedy store shuts down. With the comedy store shuttered, Rogan vanished, slipping out just as the noose was tightening. His cronies scattered like sticks in the wind. Then Tom Segura leaves. Then Joey Diaz leaves. Then Tim Dillon leaves. Then Theo Vaughn leaves. The most loyal followed to Texas, while those who had fallen out of favor remained in Los Angeles. And I'm on this island by myself. I'm like, whoa, where's everybody? Now that the comedy store was closed, Joe set his sights on a new goal. What did the man who has everything want? He wanted his own club. And when I came to Texas, one of the first things I did, I had dinner with the governor and I talked to him and his positions on these things are you gotta let people run their businesses. You gotta let people live their lives. The move marked the beginning of a new chapter, one that would see the power of Joe Rogan reach new heights. In May 2020, he landed an exclusive deal with Spotify worth more than $100 million, catapulting his show to the number one podcast in the world. Either under his spell or looking to ride his coattails, more than a dozen comedians went willingly to Austin. Fast forward though, now you live in Austin. Segura and Christina and me and Joe. We have Tim Dillon. Tim has more property in Austin than anybody. Tim's out here killing it. Ron White. It is the best situation for a comic to be in is to have access to Austin, Texas right now. Those New Yorkers that are real joke gunslingers, they come to Austin and they're looking at it. Ladies and gentlemen, Shane Gillis is moving to Austin, Texas. I don't know if I'm legally allowed to say it, but 
You can legally say Joe there. Rogan. All of a sudden, I'm in Texas, and all these other comedians come out here with me. So we just went and did it. To help run his secret society, Joe enlisted Adam Egott. He's the manager of the comedy store. You are part of the mothership. So I got all the best people from the store to come here. This is the dream team. Adam Egett, a man with his own secret and sordid past, fit right in. Your family doesn't know that when you were a young man, you used to jerk off punks for $15 a man? How insane is it to work with stand-up comics? It's fucking wild. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm insane. So, like, I have a huge void to fill, too. It's like I rode this wave perfect. Once he poached the top staff from the comedy store, the next step was constructing the perfect hideout. Monday on an all-new intervention. Is Bird an alcoholic? I'm curious what you think. Um, uh, hold on. As a liar, if you're an alcoholic, you'll get caught. The best alone drinking you can ever do is alone behind someone's back. Yeah. And that's all I want to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. Is just make machine movies. I'd love to see Bert go sober and focus on other things. What if he wants help, there's help available. There you go. I love it. I'm good. Intervention. Mondays at 10, 9 central, only on A&E. On the outside, the comedy mother shit is your average, everyday, run-of-the-mill, alien-themed comedy club. Inside tells a different story altogether. There's like these little, just tons of little things. Like here's like just a little alien. The alien theme is throughout the whole place. I feel like the stage itself with that kind of like half circle or half ring reminded me a lot of Stargate. There was this race of beings that looked just like us. They had a series of these devices called Stargates. What a Stargate does is open a stable wormhole. It's like a conduit from one planet to another. Still in secret, mind you. I mean, this is going on right now. The stage was constructed as a shrine to an interdimensional alien portal. The clues were hiding in plain sight. Great last, time at Mothership last, last night. That was a good time. Filled it and they will come. A magical portal. To fully unravel the mysteries hidden inside the comedy Mothership, look no further than one of modern history's darkest chapters. See, that's the theme of the Mothership Comedy Club. The thing is UFO theme. The rooms are called Fat Man and Little Boy. And in the UFO lore, the UFOs come right after the detonation of Fat Man and Little Boy. Mm -hmm. After the detonation of those bombs. In UFO folklore, that's like what happened. The connections don't end there. The building is alive. Yeah. That's what I like about the building. It's like the story. It was that mob hangout that Ciro's. There's like a swastika on the wall. So we tore the outside of the wall and you see the exposed brick. And one of the exposed brick was a fucking swastika. It's stated that the swastika is connected with extraterrestrial beings. You know what's really bizarre? Yeah. You 100% see those kind of things when you're tripping. And I do believe the Nazis were in touch with non-human intelligences. With the deep worship of extraterrestrials revealed, a trip to South America would reveal even more. A South American archaeologist contacted American crime with a story about a strange group who stole an ancient artifact from a sacred temple. A member of this party matched Rogan's description almost exactly. Earlier this year, a group of white men came here looking for an artifact. They ransacked a sacred temple to retrieve it. Legend has it, it would beam down a ray of light every full moon. One day, it descended from the heavens to pass down the word of God. It remained in the temple for over 100 years, until now. A man, now known locally as the White Ape, pulled out a bow and arrow and killed a group of men who tried to stop them from taking the artifact. This artifact now resides in the lobby to the mother shit. Let's do, let's do that. We need a UFO in the front lobby, a fucking actual flying saucer. Right, right, right. <laughs> Upon further analysis, the mother shit is not just a clubhouse for Rogan and his leeches, but ground zero for his alien-obsessed cult. Because a lot of people think I'm already running a cult. <laughs> 
Even stranger are Rogan's ties to intelligence agencies. I'm Not friends silence. with Mike Baker, who used to, well, he's a spook. used to be in the CIA. Well, he's a real spook. He's a nice guy. Like, he's my handler. Mike Baker, his CIA handler, is a master of deflection. Have you looked at any of the evidence of election manipulation? I'd run out of time. Just like, I'm sorry, I gotta go watch one of the kids' games. Which, by the way, one of my kids, the middle boy, Sluggo, is uh, heading to Florida to go to boarding school. To boost the credibility of the show, Mike Baker pulled strings to have whistleblower Edward Snowden appear on the podcast. I work hard on that. I try to mislead people. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> it works to my advantage. You're doing a good job, man. Thank you. What viewers didn't know was that Snowden was calling in from Mike Baker's basement. Under Baker's tutelage, a mind control method was developed involving the use of psychedelic drugs. You know, what the CIA really dreamed of was sort of like a drug you could give to someone get them to commit all sorts of unspeakable acts, and they wake up the next day and they don't remember what they've done. A continuation of the MK Ultra program, dimethyltryptamine, or DMT for short, is the drug used on comedians to turn them into Manchurian candidates. Whatever you experience when you experience dimethyltryptamine, which we know is produced by the brain, you experience entities. Joe impregnated their mind with the poisonous philosophy that the world was sick, laughter, the only medicine, and not far down the line, mass murder. Comedy is, in a lot of ways, is kind of a group hypnosis. When someone's on stage and they're killing, I'm letting that person think for me. It's hypnosis in a way. You're hypnotizing people. Once under the influence of DMT, the worship of aliens is subliminally planted in the mind. Anybody who's smoked DMT will know that you do encounter entities. What I encountered doing DMT was so spectacularly alien yeah, that that's, that's the aliens. That the thing that it's always struck me about the abduction experience, it always happens at night. There are psychedelic chemicals that your brain makes. Is that where they're happening while they're lying in bed? Because your brain is just dumping psychedelics into you and you're having interaction with aliens every night. And, and then there they are. It, it might be that there's a chemical gateway in your mind that when breached, you enter into a dimension. Then there's his obsession with not just primates, but werewolves as well. I was just thinking about that metal statue you have out there, the wolf fucking the gorilla. And I had this dream that I was like sneaking around, hoping they wouldn't notice me while, yeah. while werewolves was fucking a gorilla. His recent coming out as a furry raises even more questions. This is our first podcast coming out as our true selves. Rumors of wild sex parties have persisted for years. I know some bald fucking dudes are slinging dick out there. Look at Dana White, Rogan. I can't get this fucking Yeah, it happened to me in the five seconds I had it on too. Sexual degeneracy permeates the fabric of this secret society. I would never suck your nuts. I don't ask. You do get up in there. I'm glad to have a best friend like that. I know, man. Hey, cutie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Strangely, Mr. Rogan had sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein's personal chef on his show, never to bring up the connection once during the softball interview. And I, that's what I like to do. I mean, you know, more age doesn't necessarily mean better. It's just different. Their secret society now extends beyond the comedy world. This cult has a hierarchy filled with scientists, Navy SEALs, and even celebrities. How fun was it to work out with The Rock? It's crazy. <laughs> You've been mean? bragging about it nonstop. It's your new best friend, Brad Pitt. I've become friends with Matthew McConaughey. I had dinner with his family. Roger Waters is my homie. And then we all hung out. It's one of the weirdest of my homies, like my famous homies. Jared Leto's not a fucking government agent. I heard this one rumor that you live in like an, an old military complex. Is it, it true? It is true. I had dinner with him and drinks. He's a fucking great guy. It is at these dinners where Joe holds court, his hierarchy on full display, flaunting his power. I've been in rooms with Joe with some formidable people. He's the most powerful media person who's ever lived. He didn't get to where he was by accident. Andrew Schultz, 
a lieutenant in the death squad, the man who replaced Brendan Schaub, a man so vain, he always sits in a manner that will show off his expensive watch and sneakers. An avid social climber, Schultz has been a part of many secret and lavish dinner meetings. And we what sat happened? down at a great steak restaurant. We all went out to dinner. And we go with Bob Lazar. You're talking about proof of another planet, another intelligence. And Bob Lazar is detailing to us shit that he couldn't even talk about on the podcast. Wild. <laughs> I'm sorry, the migraine is really making it hard for me to think. Many believe this is where Joe plans his hits and quells dissension in his ranks. Oh, why aren't you playing the mothership, Brennan? I don't deserve to be there. And me and Rogan have had this conversation. We were out of dinner about a month ago, and uh, it's just pet peeve not to bring it up. You and I together, I need a platform, and you need to let me come on the show. And Rogan's like, stop, not stop, you're not coming to my show. And Alex's like, I know, I think it'd be good. He's like, stop, stop, quit fucking asking me. Rogan was a savage on him. I want him dead. I want his family dead. I want his house burnt to the ground. I want to go to the middle of the night. I want to burn you oh, fucking people have the weirdest things you focus on. <laughs> <laughs> Just, what do you mean, you people? What you. Do you mean? Their sycophantic laughter revealed some harsh truths. <laughs> Every comedian reveals their secrets openly, never to receive any consequences. Stavros, Greek, last name, Bert Kreischer. Two comedians of great girth, better known for how they laugh rather than for the jokes they tell. It's never not funny. <laughs> <laughs> A prime example of how comedians openly discuss their deadly agenda, free of consequences. And I go, yeah, but we also send people through the fucking roof. We never think about the flip side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. A comic's brain is so different than a, than a pedestrian's brain. Kreischer, a loose-lipped Russian intelligence operative, can't help but expose secrets when trying to please others. I mean, that's like the Joe I knew. And then $375 million later. Kreischer let slip the extent of Joe's Spotify fortune and thus how he maintains power and influence. You know, when you're seeing these guys like Brian Simpson going up and murder and Shane Gillis is going up and murder and Tony Hinchcliffe is going up and murdering, there's like a feeling in the building. This culture of comedy it makes me feel like we're of the same tribe. With the mother shit open, it was now time to start training the next generation of assassins. Hey, Kill Tony fans, it's finally here. Hell yeah. It's the all new talking Tony Hinchcliffe doll. We've become an arena act. Each doll comes with seven key phrases. What's the gay part of town? Just pull the string and watch what he'll say next. I didn't know that Mythbusters had Down syndrome. This is one doll you don't want to hide in the closet. <laughs> the all new talking Tony Hinchcliffe doll from Comedy Brain Toys. I love it. Buy yours today. The comedy community grows in size and influence every day. It was only a matter of time before the ugliness of this seedy underworld spilled over into civilian life. 48-year-old Sheldon Johnson charged with murdering a man and then dismembering his body. That's Johnson appearing on the popular Joe Rogan podcast. Now a group of detractors have emerged to strike back at these egomaniacal stool humpers. Jada, I love you. G.I. Jane 2, can't wait to see it. <laughs> oh, wow. It was a G.I. Jane jump. I was sickened. This is a really clear indication that uh, we're not the cool club anymore. Comedian Dave Chappelle attacked on stage while performing at the Hollywood Bowl. Make some noise for hip hop history. A local man accused of attacking Dave Chappelle on stage says he didn't like Chappelle's jokes. While those who have risen up against comedians have paid with their reputations, those who have tried to help them personally have paid with their lives. Prominent Hollywood therapist Amy Harwick was found fatally injured beneath her bedroom balcony. A former boyfriend has been charged with her death. With the jury the above entitled action finding defendant, Gareth Kurstoff, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. Famed Hollywood sex therapist Amy Harwick the latest victim of this deadly subculture. Comedian Drew Carey, her former fiance, speaks on her giving nature. 
She cared so much about helping people, That's, uh, that was her life's purpose. Gareth Pursehouse, the ex-boyfriend responsible for her murder, was a contestant on the podcast Kill Tony. I was talking to an ex, uh -huh. and she told me that when we first met, she thought my personality meant I had a small dick. And I just want to make it perfectly clear right now that my dick size is private. Some say that Kill Tony is the center of the comedy universe. And Kill Tony is the cornerstone of the stand-up community. Mm -hmm. Because Kill Tony is this wild YouTube show. HEB Center sold out arenas that we're doing, no big deal. They pull your name out of a bucket and you have one minute to perform in front of a live audience. And here at the number one live podcast in the world. And it's like a roast table, yes. right? Okay. Oh yeah, you know, Tony and the guests will just destroy that person. Edward Scissorhands over here, if he's a, <laughs> after being made a real man again. And Tony's like the best roaster alive. While others say it is a low-level American Idol ripoff. A trial by fire for amateur comedians, its true purpose, to make its host, Tony Hinchcliffe, look good by comparison. Stepping on unbelievably fast, witty fucking jokes that I can't do now because the opportunity has passed. Incredible episode for Redman. He will literally do anything to crush any momentum or setup. And then you hit the, okay, you suck, Redman. Take the beating that you deserve. I'm like a power lifter that gets to go to the gym. You know, if he doesn't go to the gym, he's probably out there breaking windows and throwing shit and, you know, road rage. Not everyone is charmed by the facade. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck, this is fucking brutal. Is this gonna be an hour of this? Who are you? But I, I'm, I will never sign up to make fun of people that donate their time. Criminals don't just perform at the club, they also work there. Shout out to Joe Rogan. I don't know where the fuck he at. But well, listen, we hear that. With Kill Tony serving as the training ground where petty criminals are turned into professional killers. David Jolly, you're on the side. This is the Orlando man. Investigators say posed as a legitimate real estate agent. According to court documents, Jolly swindled at least 13 people out of nearly $90,000 by pretending he was selling their timeshares. He's also on probation right now for the exact same charge. Tony Hinchcliffe, that's my real home, boy. Stupid ass, boy. For this reason, security at the comedy mothership is tight. And where my club is on 6th Street, that's a wild place. There's a lot of crime there. We hire off-duty cops uh, to work the club. We want to make it as safe as possible. Upon admittance, patrons must surrender their cellular devices, have their faces photographed, and adhere to a strict code of silence. Welcome to Comedy Mothership. A couple things before we get started. No heckling the show, no recording the show in any way. Bathrooms in the lobby. Uh, you can check your phone in the lobby too. You know, your phones are locked up. They make you lock your phone in what's called a yonder bag. You put your phone in it, it's pretty much impossible to open. When you come in, they actually take a photo of you, like a passport photo. I gotta take a picture and lock up my phone. They now know exactly who you are. Uh, by your face and everything. I mean, this is Tony Hinchcliffe, the killer. Joe Rogan, these are murderers. Everybody has yonder bags, so the, the phones will be locked up so you can get crazy. <laughs> they, they do? At your club? <laughs> yes. Tell us something interesting about you. Cause you seem like a very, very normal white guy from San Diego yeah. trying to come into a place that's filled with monsters, so. Why has no one caught them? Why have these crimes gone unpunished, unnoticed by the public at large? Until now, there was virtual silence in regards to these atrocities. Recently, American Crime was contacted by a survivor of one of these horrific attacks. For their safety, they've asked for anonymity. I was invited to the club. I just wanted to laugh at some jokes. I wasn't prepared for what followed. Our witness was once a part of Rogan's inner circle, even though he's not a comedian. After being forced to flee for his life, he believes witnessing the mass killing was an initiation ritual. Joe had taken us all out for dinner. He was gracious enough to take us to the club afterwards. Everything seemed to be going fine. Then things took a turn for the worst. Our witness also submitted to us this recording, produced as they were fleeing for their life. We warn our viewers this recording is graphic and not for the faint of heart. One of the best comedians on planet Earth, the one and only Joe Rogan. But wait! But wait! Please take a seat! I had a pot gummy bear the other day. I think we can all agree a gummy bear shouldn't be able to steal your soul. Right? 
the fuck are these people making these things, man? <laughs> we used to be monkeys, and we found mushrooms, and now we're different. If we don't know what we're doing, if this country was a person, we'd be on coke, driving a yellow Corvette. Dollar, dollar bills, y'all! What are we doing here, man? There's certain noises we can't make with our face anymore. Despite their emotionless, robotic nature, our witness wept through most of the interview. Haunted by the memory of the massacre, he now questions his long-held personal beliefs. How has this experience affected you? I used to think love was the only answer. Love could end wars, like the one in Ukraine, for instance. After witnessing the carnage on that fateful night, I no longer know what to think. The senseless deaths of those in the crowd that night have confirmed the worst. These ruthless killers will not stop. Dog, let me put this, I'm not gonna hunt you down. But if I ever bump into you, I will run you over with a fucking car. It drives me insane, I can't beat the fuck out of these people. I'm waiting to fight somebody at a venue, I can't fucking wait. I'm like, I'm definitely going to jail if anybody sees my joke notebook. I'm just so glad to be a part of this society of misfits. Dying on stage, they call mm -hmm. it dying for a reason. I thought that was gonna get a bigger laugh. Bombing, it's yeah. called bombing. It's just nothing. So don't put it on me that you feel bad. Figure it the fuck out, okay? Don't make my life be a problem for your life. Empowered by unnatural worship and deep political connections, these life-stealing comedians show no signs of slowing down. It is estimated there are 250 of these killers on the planet. The police remain hopeful they can one day serve justice, finally bringing peace to the families of so many victims. On the next American Crime, furniture manufacturers are crippled by a growing trend. The industry is having trouble keeping up with demand. Sit, Ubu, sit. Good dog. Damn, son, where'd you find this?